Well, I'd like to in, uh, welcome all of you to our um, January uh, Emerald Chapter Native Plant Society meeting. Uh, we're really lucky to have uh, Melinda Vickers speaking tonight. I have a couple of quick announcements um, before we start the program. Uh, the first is to um, is to acknowledge uh, that we, uh, the Emerald Chapter, um, uh, the area that we cover, is located in the traditional homelands of the Kalapuya people. Today, their descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. And they constitute uh, an important, um, and they make an important contributions to our community. As the Native Plant Society of Oregon, we welcome their traditional indigenous knowledge about the ecosystems we live in. And we were lucky enough to have one of their um, uh, gentlemen from the Celeste tribe speak to us earlier this year. February, uh, our, our program is going to be, uh, Christine Buell is going to talk to us about Emerald Ash Borer. Uh, that'll be February 20th at 7 p.m. It's also going to be a Zoom presentation. Um, I think it'll be really interesting. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, uh, this, this little guy has, um, is coming. I don't, I don't know if it's in Oregon yet or not, but we'll find out where it is and how to look for it. Uh, hopefully everybody got out today. Uh, it was a beautiful day, at least this morning. And, um, just a reminder that, uh, the ferns, mosses, and lichens and non-vascular species are really abundant this time of year. They really pop out uh, when the rain comes. Uh, you can also see mistletoe up in the top right-hand corner in our oak trees. It's really easy to see it this time of year when the oak leaves are, are gone. And then um, even in January, we start seeing buds of um, of flowers coming out. So that's our, our Oregon grape, which is our state flower. Uh, I need to, um, or I wanted to just announce that um, Dave Wagner, who is a longtime member, a founding member of our chapter, has written a, um, a, a book uh, Lane County Almanac. Uh, you can uh, get it at, uh, Dave's going to have a table at our, um, our uh, Native Plant Society uh, state meeting uh, in June. And uh, I'll announce that later. Um, I think he's also selling it online and um, probably at Down to Earth where he sells his uh, calendars also. Mount Pisgah is, has started a, like an inventory project. Uh, it's, as we were saying, the non-vascular species are really prominent this time of year. So they're going to uh, do this uh, from November to March. Um, and um, I believe uh, it's an iNaturalist project and it's called the, the Lichen Project. Uh, if you want more information, you can contact August Jackson and his address is here, interpretation at Mount Pisgah Arboretum.org. Uh, our happenings for the Emerald Chapter uh, really briefly, we're in the process of putting our slate together for our board of directors. Uh, if anybody's interested in helping um, be on a, a, a committee, like uh, field trips, 
or being a member at large, please let myself, Stephen Yeager, or Bob Lackey know. Um, uh, we'd love to diversify our group. And um, then you'll see, a, if you're a member, you'll see a slate come out um, here in April. Uh, we're working on a new Lane County rare and endangered plant list. I just wanted to send a big thank you to all the folks that participated in, in that. Uh, we should have that completed sometime this, this year. This, um, and then we will work on the invasive species next and we'll be posting those lists on our website. The Emerald Chapter is hosting the um, annual meeting for the state uh, uh, Native Plant Society this summer from June, uh, June 2nd to 4th. And the um, theme is the botany in the age of uh, community science. We'll have field trips Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then um, We'll have a meet and greet at Wildcraft Cider Works and then a banquet and um, and uh, vendors at venue 242 on Saturday night. Uh, so it's a great it's a great way to meet other botanists from throughout the state. I really recommend if you're a new botanist uh, starting out, it's a great way to meet people on field trips and um, uh, I hope everybody comes. Jenny, uh, um, it's yes. venue two, 252, not 242. Oh, okay, 252. Thank you, Carl. Hard to say whether that's a big deal or not. Okay. Um, all right, so just a little bit about a, our program. Um, we'd like you to keep uh, your sound on mute. So if your dog or cat comes in the room or your husband uh, comes and um, decide, tells you that there's a phone call, we don't hear that. Um, <laughs> uh, we uh, are gonna open up uh, for questions at the end. So if you can put your questions in the chat, uh, that would be great. Uh, Steven's gonna kind of moderate that the questions at the end. And we really appreciate your um, being here with us and supporting the Emerald Chapter. And if you weren't here when we talked a little bit about the YouTube site, we will be posting the presentation on our YouTube site. And uh, we'll put that uh, link in the chat also. Um, yeah, it's on the screen right now, but yeah. I don't, yeah, it's maybe, on the screen Mark, right now. Yeah. And with that, I'm going to pass uh, pass on um, the speaking to uh, uh, Angela Soto, who is uh, on our speakers committee. Great. Thank you, Jenny. Can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming to join this Emerald Chapter program. Um, I'm Angela Soto. I am the co-chair of Emerald Chapters program committee, along with the delightful Gail Baker. And tonight we're welcoming Melinda Vickers, who will be presenting on climate and plant pollinator networks in the Cascade Range. Melinda is originally from Colorado, but has spent most of her adult life in the Pacific Northwest. She recently completed a master's degree at Oregon State University, where she did research on bees in the Oregon Cascades. Her love for bees began during her time as a Peace Corps volunteer in rural Zambia, where she worked closely with farmers and beekeepers. Melinda now lives in Olympia, Washington, and works with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. All right, take it away, Melinda. All right, share my screen. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes, we can see it, Melinda. Yep. It's it's except it's still in the uh, yeah, now it's now it's in full screen. Yep. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. And thank you all so much for having me. It is an honor to talk to you all. Um I want to start out by just saying for posterity's sake, 
um, because I have to. I do work for the Department of Fish and Wildlife in Washington, but this talk and this research is in no way related to the work that I do there. Um, so I'll be talking about um, the research I did while I was a master's student um, at Oregon State, which I completed this past summer. Um, and that work took place in the Oregon Cascades and was looking at um, plants and pollinators and um, how they're being affected by variations in climate. Um, and so, okay, so I just want to start by setting the scene a little bit. Um, all of you are Oregonians and plant enthusiasts, and I'm sure you've hopefully been out to some of these places. Um, so um, this work took place in the H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest, um, which if you drive up 126 along the Mackenzie River up to Blue River, um, that's where the, the Andrews Forest is. And at the very top of those mountains there are um, the meadows that I was looking at. Um, so if any of you have hiked up Carpenter Mountain, um, those are some of the meadows, um, and if not, other similar ecosystems are found on Iron Mountain and Cone Peak. Um, and as you can see in these photos, throughout the presentation, all of these photos are from um, the time I was out there, so different species I observed. Um, and there's a huge diversity. There's a lot of different um, plants and animals that rely on these ecosystems. Um, and my work focused specifically on bees. Um, and most people are familiar with honeybees. When they think about bees, they think about um, our managed honeybee hives. But here in Oregon, we actually have more than 500 different species of bees. Um, and worldwide, there's more than 20,000 species. Um, and there's more that are being discovered all the time. So there's a lot of bees and they also vary a lot. Um, these are all, again, species of bees that I observed in these meadows. Um, and there's, there's a lot of variation in um, their behavior and um, their life cycles. So, so some bees um, like our honeybees are social bees. Um, so they have a social structure. There is a queen bee and then there are worker bees, so they divide their labor. Um, and so honeybees and also bumblebees, um, which are those two bees you'll see on the left, are social bees. Um, and then many of our other species are actually solitary, um, which means that they spend their life cycle on their own. There's not divided labor. There's one bee that, um, reproduces and forages. Um, and um, so there, there's a lot of variation in that. And there's also variation in um, the flowers that they prefer. So um, not bees don't visit every single type of flower, right? And, and not all flowers are visited by bees. There's some that um, are pollinated by moths and other species. Um, but within flowers visited by bees, um, there's everything ranging from our honeybees, for example, that visit many, many types of flowers. Um, and they don't really have preferences necessarily um, for flowers that they visit. And this ranges to the other extreme where there are specialist bees that visit um, one specific type of flower um, they have co-evolved over time. So they have gotten really good at pollinating flowers in a really specific way. Um, and the flower has rewarded them with giving them a lot of nectar. Um, and generally specialist bees are better at pollinating. They're, they're more effective than our generalist bees. And then the final um, part of, I'll touch on about bees because I could talk about this forever, but um, is they're looking at their life cycles. So, um, so there's very different life cycles across different species of bees, but um, we'll keep in mind that um, when we're talking about, when we think about these meadows and the cascades, they spend a lot of the year under the snow, right? So 
Um, there's only a short period that, that, that it's snow free. Um, and as a result, a lot of these bees do hibernate um, and they'll, they'll hibernate all winter and emerge when the snow melts. Um, and for the bumblebees, it's a very specific, unique life cycle because one queen will emerge in springtime and build up a whole colony during the summer. And then at the end of the summer, all of the colony will die except for a queen that will hibernate and do it again the next year. Um, the only bees that live throughout the winter are the European honeybees. Okay, and so one of the ways in which we study plants and pollinators is by thinking about a network. Um, so some things, it's something similar to thinking about a social network in a way. So um, everybody is connected by a, um, who they visit with, um, except for this way. I guess that, that analogy didn't quite work, but um, the, each a pollinator is connected to each plant, um, and then pollinators are connected to each other via connections to plants. And then you can, you can um, learn things about how the system works by thinking about it as a network. Um, and when we think about these network connections and how they're formed, we have to think about, so pollinators have to be in the same location as the plant, um, which they need to rely on similar environmental factors like um, climate, so heat and um, precipitation requirements, um, as well as elevation. Um, and they also need to be around at the same time. So they need to um, be blooming at the same time that the pollinator is in the right life stage to look for nectar and pollen um, and at the right time of day. So um, again, thinking about like moths versus bees and, and so on. So we keep all, we have to think about all of this when thinking about how these networks are formed. Um, and then just thinking about when, when we characterize these networks, we can look at them to understand how resilient are they. So if there's a disturbance that comes, um, such as drought or climate change or something um, that is going to shake up the system, how well are they going to survive? Are the plants going to continue to get pollinated and be able to produce more offspring? Um, and are the pollinators going to have enough food? Um, and so two ways we can look at that are through nestedness, um, which is the best way I found to describe nestedness is if you think about a ball of yarn that's gotten really tangled up um, in the middle, you're going to have a really strong tangle and you're going to have of loops on the outside. Um, and if you cut those loops on the outside, the ball of yarn is still going to stay really tangled, right? Um, and that's kind of how nestedness works. So you might have um, a strong core group of pollinators and then a few more rare species um, that are all part of the network, but if they disappear, um, it's not going to collapse. Um, and the other thing we look at is redundancy. So you want to make sure that um, the most, the core species are all, as you see in the top um, diagram, they all are being pollinated by multiple pollinators and flowers are being visited, no, sorry, yeah, visit flowers, the, the most, um, connected pollinators are also um, having multiple food sources. So if one disappears, it's not going to fully collapse. Okay, we won't get any, oh, one more piece about networks, but so, so networks are really adaptable. Um, if you think about these systems, they've been evolving for millennia. Um, and so they are, really resilient in a lot of ways to disturbance and they have built-in mechanisms 
um, that help them adjust. And one of those is called rewiring. And this happens when there's um, a change that happens. Um, often this is maybe one species becomes less abundant or moves to a different place, um, but the ecosystem adapts. Um, so pollinators are able to visit different plants and they still are fed and the plants are able to get visited enough that they're pollinated and they're able to reproduce. And so that's a positive adaptation um, for the most part. Over, sometimes ecosystems are not able to adjust if the change is too big um, or occurs for a long period of time. And in that case, something called turnover happens. And for some reason, um, the plant or the pollinator is excluded. The, they don't receive food or pollination services and um, they disappear from that network. Okay, so stepping back from the network idea, the last part um, of background to look at with my research is looking at climate. So it's kind of climate, clim kind of weather. I'm talking about um, each summer um, as something in between climate and weather, but I refer to it as climate. And here in Oregon, we know that climate change is going to bring us hotter and drier summer, last for longer. Um, they're gonna, it's gonna bring us less precipitation in the form of snow. Um, and so you can see in this figure here, so at the moment there's different plants and pollinators that arrive at different times, right? And we talked about how they need to overlap in order to, to, to be in the right life stage in order um, to interact. Um, and with changing conditions, um, it's possible that they might change enough um, that either plants and bees that never interacted before might all of a sudden begin to interact, or um, ones that used to um, overlap might no longer overlap. Okay. So why does this matter? Why, why are we even talking about networks and... Um, and rewiring and all of this. Um, as I'm sure all of you are well aware, these meadows are incredibly uh, biodiverse places. Um, and um, they're also really threatened. We're losing a lot of the meadows in, in the Cascades, um, which is, would lead to a tremendous loss of biodiversity. Um, and bees themselves are very important. Um, humans rely on the pollination of services of bees a lot. Um, some people say one out of every three bites we eat um, is thanks to bees, the pollination services of bees themselves. Um, and this is also the same for ecosystems. Um, if you think about the plants that, that bees pollinate, um, the work that pollinators do, um, they're, they form um, the basis of all of these food webs. Um, so it's really important to know what's going on. Um, and then thinking about how we can take that information and make recommendations for uh, land managers and lawmakers figuring out how can we protect these places. So my research specifically um, had three main parts. So first, it was taking all of this huge data set and this raw data and characterizing what's actually going on in this ecosystem. What are the plants and pollinators? How do they interact? Um, and then I brought in climate, um, looked at how that impacted and led to changes over time. Um, and then finally, I brought in the network component, understanding how does this all play out on a network scale? And so my research, as I said, took place in the H.J. Andrews, um, which as you can see in this photo here, was, I was so privileged to get to work there. These, are, these meadows are very beautiful places. I highly recommend um, going and look at the, looking at those. 
um, when they're blooming this spring or summer. Um, and uh, yeah, because they're at the crest of the Cascades, beautiful views. Um, and there were 12 meadows that have been studied since 2011 um, that vary in size um, and are at about uh, 4,000 feet in elevation. Um, I was up there all of summer 2021 sampling with my field assistant. Um, and yeah, there's a variation of meadows. Some of them are um, a bit drier, a bit wetter. Some of them are facing south, north. Some of them are really steep. Um, and the first part of my research, we did flower surveys. So in each of these meadows, there are um, 10 plots that have been sampled um, in the same location for the whole study period. So we went in and we identified all of the species of flowers in each of the blooming flowers, I should say, um, in each of the plots and counted how many there were and then repeated that throughout the summer. And then uh, the second part of our surveys, we're looking at bees. Um, and there's a number of ways that researchers choose to study bees um, for more specific and like very accurate identification down to species and subspecies levels. You actually want to catch the bees and often euthanize them. Um, but we were really focused on visitation patterns. So what flowers they visited, um, what were their patterns? Did they visit multiple in one area? And so we, we just did uh, field observations and that entailed doing watches where we would sit on the edge of these plots and we would identify um, the bees and then they were visiting the flowers that were already in that we had already counted and identified. Um, and we did that five times per plot every summer as well. Um, and then the last piece of data um, we took from a weather station in the Andrews um, and used two different proxies for looking at how how hot the summer was. Um, so starting at the minimum temperature that plants are willing to grow at and then how it accumulates throughout the summer. And then looking at moisture, um, thinking about when did the rain last fall and how can we simulate when it disappears. Um, and this is 2021, which um, we'll talk about more later, but you can see it, um, the rain stopped pretty early and it got pretty hot. So, what did we find? Um, I found that it's, as I've been saying, an incredibly diverse place. Um, there are more than 200 species of flowers that were identified over this period. Um, as you can see, um, a huge variation um, and almost 200 different species of bees, which is a lot of bees. Um, and um, there's, there's a bit more of a tendency towards um, a few really common bees that were observed a lot, um, but there's a lot of um, less common bees that were observed as well. Um, something also interesting to note about um, this area is the presence of the European honeybee. Um, so honeybees are not native in the US and their origin in um, this study area is not fully known like what how they came to be but um, we expect it was because um, there was a, a hive that was placed there a number of years ago and um, a feral colony escaped and so now there's just wild honeybees um, living in the area and if we think about how big a honeybee colony is um, one colony at its prime can have tens of thousands of bees, um, which is a lot of bees. Um, and our native bees, bumblebees might have a few hundred bees. Um, and then of course we have solitary bees, which are just one. And so if you think about how the presence of 
even one colony of honeybees might impact um, interactions in these meadows. It's that's a lot of bees, um, and and thinking about how it shapes um, the plants. So if a honeybee visits certain plants more often, um, those plants are going to become more common. Um, and something that we found this. The, the presence of honeybees and the impacts um, I didn't focus a lot on, but really uh, deserves more thorough research. Um, but we did find that in the meadows that had the highest numbers of bumblebees, it had the least amount of honeybees. Um, and the opposite, the most honeybees had the lowest amount of bumblebees. So this could be an example of um, competition between the two, pushing one of them out. And something that's really interesting about this data set that we have, um, apart from not having very many long term data sets on um, this kind of work, is that we had a lot of variation between the years. So 2011 um, was much cooler and wetter than average. Um, you can see that it rained up through the end of July. Um, and it didn't really start getting hotter until then. And so you saw flowers blooming um, up through September and bees continuing to visit up through September. Whereas on the other hand, in 2015, um, it was much hotter than average and um, the rain kind of stopped in June, early June and got started to get much hotter earlier on. And as a result, most likely um, the bees and the flowers um, were already kind of slowing down by the time it got to be um, July. 2021, the year that I was out there was also an interesting year because um, you all probably remember the heat dome, the big heat wave that came through in the summer. And um, it was, um, not as bad in the meadows as some other areas where bees were literally dying because it was so hot, um, like in the valley. Um, but these are really exposed areas um, that are not necessarily heat tolerant. So we did see heat effects. And um, one of the largest effects <clears throat> was with uh, blue gilia, gilia capitata, um, which you can see um, here in 2018. Um, Grow, it's very abundant in these meadows. It grows all over. Um, and for the first eight years of the study, it made up 20% um, of all of the visits. So it's very abundant and a very popular flower. Um, and then conversely, in 2021, um, the gilia was just starting to bloom um, in June, um, right before the heat wave. And, I went away for the weekend and came back and that's this is what all the gilia looked like. Um, and we didn't see any more blue gilia the rest of 2021 and it only accounted for 8% of all the visits we observed. But the positive thing here is that um, Oregon sunshine is also in these meadows, Areophyllum lanatum, and um, this flower has a lot of built-in characteristics that make it tolerant to high heat. Um, so we didn't really see much of an impact um, in 2021. And you could see an evidence of shift. Bees visited um, Oregon sunshine more. So whereas before it only was about 9% of all the visits in 2021, 25% of all the visits we were we observed were to Oregon Sunshine um, because it um, was still growing so well after the heat wave. Um, and one positive update here, um, not only did we see this instance of rewiring, um, someone was out in the meadows this past summer in 2022, um, which if we remember, it was raining later into the year, and it appears that the gilia was able to make somewhat of a recovery. Um, 
which is great for the bees. Okay, so overall results, I won't go too deep into these graphs, but basically in the years that were much cooler and much hotter than average, um, we saw a lot less flowers um, blooming and they were blooming for a shorter period of time. Um, bees had less of a correlation. Um, they were slightly kind of reduced um, in timing, but that's probably just because of, um, of the flowering period. Okay. And then moving on to networks. So this is a visualization that I made of a simplified visualization of all of the plants and the pollinators um, that are present in this um, in this system. Again, simplified version. Um, and this is what we were talking about earlier, how they're connected by which um, flowers they pollinate, and then bees are connected to each other through um, common flowers. And so what we can see from this, um, there are specialist bees in their, our system. There are bees that only visit one type of flower. Um, however, all of these are connected to the network via generalists. So they have, they visit one type of flower that was also visited by one of these core generalists in the middle. And then you have redundancy. We have a really tangled ball of yarn. So there's a core group of generalist species um, where multiple bees are visiting the same plants. Um, plants are visited by multiple pollinators and specialists are connected to generalists. Um, this is another visualization looking at um, here. These are the most common species of bees and the most common species of wildflowers that were observed. Um, and then each green square just indicates that this species of bee visits this species of flower. And so what we can see from this is there's a core group of generalists. So these, these species here, these most common um, bees visit all of these different flowers combined. And then out here, you have a large group of specialists. So bees that really prefer to visit um, one species of flowers. And that gives us an indication that this is a robust network. Okay, so the main takeaway from this, um, looking at how um, this is a look at rewiring. Um, so in years that have similar heating, so years that are similar temperature, um, we can see um, that there is the most change in composition of flower species. Um, and then furthermore, um, from that, in the years that we have the greatest change in um, species of flowers, we also see um, the most amount of changes in plant pollinator interactions. So the most rewiring. So summarized here, so flower turnover, so new arrangements in flower species is leading to more rewiring. And then on the left here, a lot of that is caused by the heating, the summer heating leading to changes in species, and then finally changes in interactions. Okay, so what does that mean for climate change? What, is, what do we think is gonna happen? Um, so first the negatives, um, climate change is likely going to be uh, most threatening to individual species in these meadows. Um, so plants that have low heat tolerance, um, particularly if there are heat waves, um, to specialist bees, um, if there's a plant that 
shifts enough, either location, timing, um, or disappears, and the bee doesn't move with it, um, it's the most um, susceptible to these changes. Um, and then finally, I didn't um, go over this, but I also looked at meadow moisture content. Um, and those moderate moisture meadows are the most susceptible to change. Um, and one of the biggest challenges for facing these places, we talked about how there's most of the year these places are covered in snow um, and that's changing, right? So we're getting long summers um, and that means a longer period in the fall where there's no food available to these pollinators, a longer period with, um, with no, no flowering. Um, and as well, the flowering is shortening. But the good news um, is that overall, all signs pointed to this network um, being resilient to variation in climate. Um, and that is because we saw multiple instances of rewiring. In 2021, we had a terrible heat wave, um, but the network adapted. Um, they were able to find food elsewhere. Um, and the gilia was able to come back. Um, and we also see rewiring between years. Um, the abundance of bees, we saw very, like no correlation with heat. Um, and then in our driest and our wettest meadows, there was very little um, impacts over time. There was um, a lot more moderation in terms of um, how, how heat impacted these places. Um, and then just thinking about meadows. So these places are really valuable because of their high biodiversity. I know I keep saying this, but it's really, um, really true. Um, they're home to more than 75% of the biodiversity in the whole Cascade range. Um, and then thinking about pollinators specifically, um, it is true that there are a lot of flowering plants that are found outside of meadows um, in forests and clear cuts and roadsides and are all around, but none of them hold the, the biodiversity or the, the quantity of flowers that we find in meadows. And there's a lot of pollinators that spend their whole life cycle in these meadows um, and a lot of other species that rely on them um, for for their um, lives as well. And so, okay, so what do we do with this information? Um, I think um, it's really important to think about how we can prioritize conserving these meadows. Um, not only are they um, being threatened by climate change, um, there's also been, um, over the last 50 years, a lot of trees have been entering these meadows. Um, this bottom photo is one of the study sites um, where you see saplings coming in at an increased rate because of climate change. Um, and so we need to include meadows in forest management plans. Um, and also these places, um, the meadows in the Oregon Cascades um, were maintained by indigenous peoples. They were um, likely uh, seasonal hunting grounds. Um, and so we really need to incorporate traditional ecological knowledge into understanding how we can maintain these places. Um, and then thinking about pollinators specifically, um, a lot of our management of species at the moment focuses a lot on rare and endangered species. And while those are important as well, um, if we think about species that are not quite so endangered, um, that are not on the verge of extinction, um, those also deserve our time. Um, there are several species that um, are not close to being endangered or threatened in um, these meadows, but play such an important role in maintaining the ecosystem and maintaining the network um, that 
they deserve to be part of a plan in, um, in uh, figuring out how to uh, protect these places. And so finally, um, I just really appreciate thinking about bees and insects. And um, ever since starting to do this research, it's kind of totally changed how I look at the world. Um, and so even if you all are not um, entomologists, I hope that um, the next time you're out um, in the spring or summer um, looking at beautiful flowers, you can also stop and appreciate all the, the different bees and start getting curious about um, the pollinators as well. Um, and yeah, thank you to Julia, my wonderful advisor, and these different funding programs and H.G. Andrews. And that is all I have. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Just... Great. Thank you so much, Belinda, for your presentation, for being with us tonight. Um, I guess I, I have a question, or maybe a comment and a question, and then we have a mm -hmm. couple other questions. Um, did you study the wetter, I, maybe I missed this, did you study the wetter meadows that are wet in the spring with uh, species like Cotha, uh, Marsh Marigold, Pedicularis? Because um, I've noticed cha uh, rapid changes in the past 25 years of the, the willows and the alders encroaching on those really? wetter spots. Yeah. Were yeah. those included in your study? or? Yeah, those, those so ecosystems? they're... Yeah, so we have, um, there's 12 meadows and um, the student who started the project um, or the, the long-term study was looking at um, a range in, uh, in moisture content. And we had two that were, um, they stay saturated. They stay wet until um, for the first, like through the beginning of summer. Um, and yeah, definitely seeing encroachment from willows and uh, Sitka alders and some of those. Yeah. Jenny, I know you had a question. Did you want to present it here or want me to read it? Or? Well, I I Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, yeah, well, so my question was, um, uh, it looks like if you only did your research for one year and you didn't collect bees, how did you identify all those bees? I mean, that must have taken quite a bit of uh, time and energy. Was Andy Maldenke yes. one, of, one of the ones that did that? Yeah, yeah, Andy has been very involved in this project. And like, the so first of all, yeah, my data set um it started in 2011 and so I'm using like all of when I'm talking about all the species we found it's not just 2021 it's that whole time um, and so it's a combination of like when um, when we're out in the field um, watching the bees and observing them um, and identifying that way um, but then also yes Andy was very helpful in that um, and then some, if we're not able to identify through field observations, we use a combination of photos and then capturing some of them. Okay, so you, so you did, I was just kind of wondering if this, if the, um, the suites of bee species have been changing along with the climate. Um, are you seeing, are you seeing a shift? Yeah, that's- There too? That's a really good question, and it's a really hard one to answer. <laughs> I would imagine, yeah. Because there's some, there's like, for example, there's one species of bee, of bumblebee, that was observed in 2011 and 2012, and we haven't seen it since, um, but we don't know if that doesn't mean it's not there. Um, it's just possible that we've missed it. Um, maybe it just didn't visit the meadows while we were there um and so it's that's the hard thing about observing flying insects is it's it could be in like it it could mean it's no longer there but it could also just mean that 
we missed it. Um, and so we're always trying to like refine our methods. And so some of, um, I know the PhD student who's working up there now <clears throat> has put in some like cameras to observe, um, just trying to figure out more ways that like we take out the presence of humans and have a longer time period to observe. Right, so I was just thinking maybe they emerge uh, earlier or something. I mean, yeah. did, could they sh shift their um, their life cycles a little bit in yeah, relation exactly. to? Yeah, that's cool. That's very cool. I, I know Tanya has a question. I also encourage the group to uh, post any questions in the chat or uh, just unmute yourself and jump in. Well, I was just curious. You said um, in 2021 that the, the Gilea capitata mm -hmm. um, uh, basically dried out, which it was the driest spring that we've had in the 30 years I've been here. It was just awful. Mm -hmm. um, how exactly did it come back? What, what, what do you mean? by it came back, it recovered. Once yeah. they're dead, they're dead. Um, well, so it didn't recover last year, or sorry, in 2021, it did not recover. Um, it was all wiped out. And so we were worried that how is it gonna, what's gonna happen the next year? Um, but oh, okay. the folks you who just, were up there right. in 2022 um, did see Gilead. Okay, yeah, it just the seed bank is pretty full. Yeah. I have seen once there was a, a, a rain in August and some of what looked like dead gilia sprouted up a couple of little things. The roots hadn't died, just the upper part. Wow. But usually when they're, once they're toasted for the year, they're, they're done. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions. Any, any other questions for Melinda? Not seeing any. Okay. Well, um, thank you all for joining us this evening, and uh, thank you again, Melinda. Yeah. And uh, I'll be post. We'll be posting the the um, pro pro uh, programs on the YouTube uh, website in the coming week. Yeah. Thank you for having Great. me. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. <laughs>